thank you all for joining us for this webinar, which is part of our series of presentations being delivered on applying evidence in practice as part of the comorbidity project, which is funded by the Australian Government Department of Health. My name is Catherine Mills. I'm Professor and Director of Early Intervention and Treatment Research at the Matilda Centre for Research in Mental Health and Substance Use at the University of Sydney. And along with Dr. Christina Morell, who leads this program of work, and Erin Madden, who's a project uh, officer on it as well, I have the pleasure of facilitating this webinar, which will be presented by Professor Francis K. Lampkin, Professor Adrian Dunlop, and Dr. Lawrence Dadd. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting today. Um, the traditional owners of the lands that I'm currently on are the Gadigal and Wongal people of the Eora Nation. But I'd also like to extend those respects to the traditional owners of the lands upon which you are all meeting today. And I'd also like to recognise and acknowledge the many people with lived experience of mental illness and substance use, as well as their families and carers, many of whom have generously contributed to the development of um, comorbidity guidelines and other resources. So everyone here is probably quite the Zoom expert by now. But just to quickly go over a few things before we begin, just to let you know that everyone attending today's live webinar is in listen only mode, which means that we can't see or hear you. So I'd like to draw your attention to the Q&A and chat buttons on your screen. And please feel free to click on the Q&A button and type in any questions you have at any time during the presentation. We will have presentations, we've got three. We will have time for the discussion at the end of all of those presentations. And we'll go through as many questions as we can. If you have any comments or anything that is not for our presenters, please use the chat button. And if you experience any technical issues during the webinar, you can contact Zoom support for help with that. Uh, lastly, the webinar is being recorded, so you can access the recording of the webinar as well as the PDF handouts of the slides um, from today on the website that's on the screen now. Just give us a day or so to be able to upload them. Um, if you do find Zoom chat distracting, uh, you can also have a play around with the settings on your end to disable the messages you see. To do this, you'll need to go into the Zoom desktop app if you have it, click on the settings wheel in the top right hand corner of the screen, and then select chat on the navigation menu. And that way you should be able to change what messages you see by changing the push notifications or um, your do not disturb times also. But it may take some time um, fiddling to get those settings right. So we've got the Zoom link there for more information on the screen, but you can also um, follow up on that after if it's something that interests you. Um, so as I said, we've got an exciting series of webinars over the next few months, and you can find out more about those and register for our upcoming webinars on our website, uh, the link on the screen there. And thank you very much to everyone who has given us suggestions for future webinars um, at the end, in our end of survey, sorry, end of webinar surveys. We do ask for suggestions. So please let us know if you have any topics you'd particularly like to see as part of this series and we'll see what we can do. So it's now my very great pleasure to introduce our presenters for today, Professor Francis K. Lampkin, Professor Adrian Dunlop and Professor Lawrence Dabb. Francis is a registered psychologist and mental health researcher who also holds several leadership roles. Her extensive uh, research program focuses on the transformative impact of digital health technologies and integrated treatment for people with mental health and substance use conditions. Adrian is Director and Senior Staff Specialist for Hunter New England Local Health District Drug and Alcohol Services and has 25 years experience working in the drug and alcohol field. And Lawrence is a senior staff specialist in mental health and substance use at Hunter New England Local Health District as well, with extensive experience in Indigenous community outreach via his roles with Awabago Aboriginal Medical Service and the Wolatuka Institute at the University of Newcastle. So I'm so glad that Francis, Adrian and Lawrence were able to take the time to be here today and share their wealth of knowledge. Um, so I will hand over to you now, Francis. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kath and, and Chris and Erin, and it's just wonderful to be here today. And I'm so grateful, I'm loving seeing all the chats coming through, and I'm very grateful to everybody for setting aside time in their very busy schedules at this the end of this very busy and uh, 
I don't know what word to use for 2021, but a year that it has been to um, still think about updating our knowledge and coming together to talk about um, the multiple harms uh, associated with substance use and um, and mental health conditions and the things that we might do as researchers, but as clinicians um, and as people with lived experience and people supporting people with that lived experience to help try to reduce those harms. So I'd particularly like to thank Lawrence and Adrian for taking time out of their very busy clinical days to be with us and to share some insights uh, from the field, from the real world um, on how they are integrating and responding to the multiple morbidities and multiple issues um, with which people who are using Using their services um, face in accessing um, their treatments. This figure here um, I'll start with just uh, actually comes from our wonderful comorbidity guidelines um, and they really do uh, just uh, point out what the various harms are that are associated most commonly with people who are experiencing mental health concerns and also using alcohol and other drug use in the context of those mental health concerns. And of course there are a number of, of harms, a number of challenges, a number of issues that people are facing and today particularly we are just focusing on the poorer physical health that tends to go along with the experience um, of having a mental health concern um, and a substance use concern as well. Sorry, Francis, I'm just going to jump in. Not sure if you want to swap your view. Oh, thank you. Is that better? Perfect. Excellent. Thank you. Oh. I work in technology and I'm the one where technology has uh, really failed. I failed myself today. Um, what I thought I would do just in my five minute introduction before I let Lawrence and Adrian talk um, about those uh, real world clinical experiences is share with you uh, what I think is a really important document in addition to the comorbidity guidelines um, that was published in the Lancet Psychiatry uh, a year or so ago and really focuses on identifying what the major physical health comorbidities are for people who are experiencing Experiencing mental disorders. So I have uh, the summary, uh, um, the summary citation of this um, Lancet um, Psychiatry Commission um, journal article on these particular issues down in the bottom right hand corner there. But this is just one of the tables that was reported in that article that summarizes across meta analyses. So that's what you see when you see MA written there and systematic reviews, SRs, just highlighting what the evidence suggests to us are the main physical health concerns um, as, a, as a function of the different um, mental health disorders that, that has, has been researched to date. And so as you can see, there are um, extremely high risks associated with alcohol use disorders um, that people with mental health disorders are, are significantly more likely to experience. Tobacco use is also a significant concern. Along with those disorders uh, and those issues and those behaviours, things like physical activity really remains uh, an area of concern. Um, people with uh, a range of mental disorders, often by a function of the symptoms that are ex experienced as a, as a function of, of major depression, um, or schizophrenia particularly might be more sedentary than people without those conditions. Um, diet is also a challenge and sleep patterns are also uh, a real challenge to regulate um, and to engage in really high quality, good quality sleep when you are experiencing uh, mental health disorders and alcohol and other drug use disorders. And for me, this table uh, really nicely summarizes, as I said, what the evidence suggests uh, around those key physical health comorbidities, but highlights that um, I think uh, some real indications for how our, our treatments and our supports of people who come to us um, in our services, um, seeking treatment and support, um, really need to, to some additional support around. So it's not just always around um, symptomatic relief, um, of person's experience of mental disorders or alcohol use disorders, but often that needs to be embedded in a range of other lifestyle supports um, that Lawrence and, and Adrian will talk to you a little bit more about. But doing so comes uh, with some challenges. And I think if it was very easy for us to identify and to do and to respond to as clinicians, as family and friends who are supporting people with, with mental disorders and alcohol and other drug use disorders, and for people who are experiencing these conditions themselves, um, if it was easy, we'd be all doing it and we'd be funded to do it and, and we wouldn't be having this uh, webinar today. And certainly um, the first Lancet Psychiatry Commission article also highlighted that in responding to some of these additional physical health concerns uh, in mental illnesses, there are some issues. 
So we do know that in those meta-analyses and systematic reviews um, highlighted to us the, the increasing and higher rates of, of prevalence of a range of physical um, and alcohol and drug use issues that arise in people who are experiencing mental disorders, but also that uh, we have issues with our prescribing practices and how we might manage the side effects with some of the prescription medications um, that we ask people with mental disorders uh, and alcohol and drug use disorders to take. We also find that people um, with mental disorders and alcohol and other drug use disorders tend to miss out on some of those health promotion initiatives that might give them the skills and the information that they need um, to, to um, overcome some of those physical activity, the sedentary behaviour, the diet um, and the sleep issues that the previous table highlighted. And I think also, as, as perhaps Lawrence and Adrian will touch on a little bit, this fragmentation of our mental health and drug and alcohol services from our general medical services um, can also present huge barriers to people with mental disorders and alcohol and drug use disorders from accessing a holistic um, care package in support of their total health and mental health and wellbeing. And so the Lancet Psychiatry Commission article here presents some ideas for us in, in how we might overcome some of these issues. Um, and that of course starts with really good health policy that um, asks service providers, service leaders, and people who are organizing services to consider in trying to address some of these behavioral risk and lifestyle style risks of people with mental illness um, and drug and alcohol use concerns. We definitely need to improve our prescribing practices for both psychiatric medications, cardioprotective drugs um, and alcohol and drug use, um, pharmacotherapy. And of course, um, which is my particular area of concern um, and interest, really looking at how we might be able to leverage digital technologies to really monitor and promote physical health in people who are accessing our mental health and drug and alcohol services. And we might come back to that a little bit later in the day but particularly increasing access to these integrated mental physical health care paradigms wherever a person tends to uh, or is able to access treatment in our services really is a critical step in promoting good physical health um, amongst people who are experiencing mental and drug and alcohol use disorders. And so that means that if we have any hope of preventing or responding to this concept of multi-morbidity, um, so the multiple um, health concerns that people present with when they're trying to access mental health and drug and alcohol clinical services, we have an imperative to try to integrate evidence-based care and also efficiently um, manage um, and help people with physical health comorbidities uh, in the context of mental illness manage by improving accessibility, referral pathways, and the quality of our dedicated parallel service um, systems. So that is the blue blueprint. That's what we in our universities, uh, in our research worlds, in somewhat of our ivory towers um, think needs to happen. Um, and now it's my absolute pleasure to hand over firstly to Dr. Lawrence Dad, who will talk to us a little bit about how from his perspective in a mental health and substance use service um, here in the Hunter New England Local Health District, has tried to respond to, adapt and think about some of these, uh, these issues from a service perspective. So thanks again for your time today, Lawrence. I'm going to stop sharing and hand over to you to take us through some of your perspectives. Um. So have I, have I got the right screen up? Yep. Yep. And people can hear me. Um, so I won't intro, reintroduce myself, but um, I'd just like to start by paying my respects to traditional owners over all the lands that we are uh, watching this from and, and presenting from. Um, acknowledge elders in the audience and Aboriginal people in the audience. And I, I saw that there are some overseas uh, attendees as well. So welcome everybody. Um, so I work in a mental health and substance use service and um, people might have seen this quadrants of care uh, diagram before, but basically there's an axis with alcohol and other drugs on one axis and mental illness on the other. Um, the, the service I work in is an integrated um, drug and alcohol mental health service. And so we see people who have reasonably high severity of both mental health and, and drug and alcohol problems. And particularly um, when, those, when those issues are quite enmeshed so that the drug and alcohol leads to more mental health problems and the mental health problems leads to more drug and alcohol problems. 
and then integrated services where both service or the one service is doing both those things. Another another way of managing this group of people is is a parallel kind of model of care, where you have a mental health service working alongside a drug and alcohol service, which requires um, uh, you know good good working relationships and things. And sequential is another version. It, it doesn't seem to work as well when people have severe enmeshed comorbidity. And um, in historically, it often meant that one service would say, you come back to us when the other service has fixed the other issue. Um, and then obviously, for if the mental health issues are much more severe than the drug and alcohol, then mental health services tend to look after those and vice versa for alcohol and other drugs. So that's reasonably simple. And if, if there's a low to moderate severity of, of one or the other or both, then primary health care. So that's kind of where we sit. We used to be called a dual diagnosis service, but a, a lot of things are now dual diagnosis service. So it, it no longer applies to just mental health and substance use. Um, but it does remind me that there's a lot of comorbidity. And so before 2013, with the introduction of DSM-5, there was a multi-axial diagnostic system. And I think um, it just reminds you of some of the comorbidities that can be there. So access one is obviously mental health disorders, but in the comorbidity guidelines, they also talk about mental health conditions, which aren't as severe as, as, as mental health disorders as such, but, um, and especially things like comorbid anxiety and depression symptoms, at least. Access two is personality disorders, but I'm um, thinking about all trauma. Access three is medical comorbidity, which is a, a bit of what we're talking about particularly today. Access four, psychosocial issues, so forensic, housing, employment, uh, domestic violence, et cetera, et cetera. So the thing is, do we kind of work in silos or do we manage all these comorbidities? Um, so th there's a 360 edge report on basically to integrate or not integrate mental health and drug and alcohol services. And it's a good, it's a good report. There's lots of interesting discussion points, but um, don't have time to go through all of those today. One of the things is um, why, if you're gonna integrate alcohol and other drug and mental health, would you not integrate all the other services where there's comorbidities? So, link them up with Department of Housing, Centrelink, domestic violence, uh, child protection, et cetera, et cetera. So the thing is that that's probably not sensible, and, um, but we do have a role to recognize, respond and refer appropriately. So, you know, but one of the things is that silos don't really meet the needs of our patients. So a lot of our service users prefer a one-stop shop. So what gets in the way of that? I guess doing everything is too much and there's probably some evidence that you can de-skill in the thing that you're meant to be uh, uh, specialising in. But even if you're just screening for things, um, you need to be able to have some sort of response if the answer to the screen is yes, you have to do something. And I think for a long time that might have been a barrier in mental health services, asking about drug and alcohol, for example, not knowing for sure what to do next. Um, and depending what you're screening for, there's a whole lot of... Um, therapeutic guidelines and things for all sorts of disorders that you would then need to learn about. Um, so but what can be done if we can't do everything? I mean, I, I guess one thing is to not ignore comorbidities because uh, ignoring them doesn't mean that they're not there. Um, learning how to do some stuff and working out what, what that's gonna be. Um, and so I've just got some kind of examples of important and urgent and common and falls into your lap kind of categories. And then um, working out, I guess, for yourself and your service, what you can do and what you will need help doing and develop some pathways to um, refer appropriately. Um, so for example, uh, a fairly urgent thing was acute dystonic reactions in the old days with, with a lot of our antipsychotic medications, but that was fairly easy to kind of notice um, and it was fairly easy to manage. You basically reduced the antipsychotic dose or added cogentin. So that was all sort of done in-house and didn't need a lot of external uh, referring. Occasionally, if things were very complicated, you might get a second opinion somewhere. But the thing with the newer um, antipsychotics, uh, and so this is an important uh, and common issue, is that there's a lot more um, comorbidity with metabolic syndrome issues. So heart disease, lipid problems, hypertension, diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. And they tend to sneak up on 
people a bit more. Um, it doesn't happen straight away. Uh, it's not always as easy to recognise early. Um, and there's so many aspects to it that to kind of become an expert in all of those areas is, is problematic. So what are some of the things that we can do? I guess there's a lot more thought now about choice of medication to try and minimise side effects before you get started. There's always this debate about whether you change the medication later on when if side effects happen or if you start with a medication that's uh, going to be less problematic. So that, that's kind of one of the issues. Mental health services do do a lot more regular routine screening now um, uh, before medications are started as, as well as along the, the pathway so that things can be picked up early or even treated before the medication, uh, before the um, antipsychotics in this example are, are started. Um, and the other thing is to refer appropriately and develop um, pathways, as I said before. So having good relationships with GPs, and I think these relationships have to work both ways. So it's not just about sort of sending everybody out to GPs, but also having good relationships that work in the other direction. Um, and just one example here is in next door to the Clozapine Clinic is an endocrine clinic and they work together. And I think they call it the McCapple Clinic so that they're kind of working together for the patients who are at high risk of some of these metabolic issues. Some of the things we can do, especially in a, um, a service that you know looks at stage of change and motivational interviewing is, is some behavior change with smoking and weight and th things like that. Um, Francis talked a lot about the smoking comorbidity before. So again, asking uh, routine questions, so screening. And I think if it's routine, it makes it easier for staff and it makes it less of a, an unusual thing for, for patients. Advise, giving uh, clear, strong, personalised advice about risk. Um, and I think that this sort of advice is expected of health staff and it's not a surprise. And, and if you don't provide it, you know, I've heard some people feel that oh, my doctor didn't say it was a problem, so it must be okay. So I think we do have a role to make a bit of a big deal about it. I guess from a motivational interviewing stage of change point of view, that might be a, a bit of an issue at times, but there is a thing in motivational interviewing framework, which is asking permission to give that advice. So, you know, do you mind if I give you some advice about the risk from smoking? And if so most people will say, yeah, yeah that's okay. Um, and just, it, bring, it brings the, the uh, guard down a bit. Uh, but even if they say, yeah, don't, no, I don't want you to tell me, I know all about it. You could sort of follow up with, or tell me some of the things you've been told before. Assessing motivation. So this is just that, you know, people who are pre-contemplative or contemplative uh, may need a different sort of approach than people who are actually ready to change. Um, but sometimes that is like just even talking about to people, like if you do change your mind, this is some of the things we could do. Um, assist is another one of the five A's. And that, that can include NRT, nicotine replacement therapy, knowing things about short acting and long acting nicotine replacement therapy, uh, knowing th some things about uh, medications like veronicline uh, and that the EAGLE study actually showed that people with mental health disorders aren't more at risk of psychiatric um, side effects. So uh, the benefits of, of not smoking outweigh the, the risk. Uh, it still can be a risk for anybody. And so that just needs to be watched out for. And I've usually found that just stopping the medication usually kind of allows any of that to reverse. Um, and warning people about it. And then sort of um, either counselling that you can do or referring outwards and using uh, quit line and stuff like that. Um, and the follow-up, uh, arranging follow-up, we incorporate a lot of this into our regular individual reviews, but it's also part of our group programs in the pre-COVID times when we could have groups. Um, so it's, it's often a topic that comes up in, in discussions, um, uh, and, and a lot of the people in the groups have, have dealt with this or are trying to deal with it. And so, and the advice that comes from the peer-to-peer -peer uh, group is quite influential. And then a fall into your lap type intervention. Um, so the New South Wales Ministry of Health in New South Wales, uh, sorry, has a, um, a hep C elimination by 2028 target. Um, the, the issue with some of these new treatments that came out is they're very effective. Um, they also don't have the same interferon problems with mental health patients that, um, that the old interferon uh, treatments did have. Um, 
a lot of the patients who were in drug and alcohol settings or hepatitis liver clinics um, had already been screened. So they're looking for other places to find them. And so mental health is, is one place. And so with support from um, population health, uh, this is something that they approached us to kind of try and do. So one of the things with traditional model of care with hepatitis is that you kind of, you see your doctor and then they send you off for a blood test. So you might not get the blood test and then you got to come back to get the result and you may not come back. And then you've got to, if that antibody is positive, you need an RNA test, another chance to get lost to follow up, uh, need fibre scan, another chance to get followed up, lost to follow up and then get the prescription, et cetera, et cetera. So there are all these places that could be lost to uh, follow up. So some of the things we've tried to do, um, we offer routine screening of people already who've, who've come in. So we have a sort of opt out thing for the inpatient and an opt in for uh, community patients. The testing's available on site. Um, we also order, organize reflex testing so that um, it's just one form. And if the hep C antibody is positive, then the lab will automatically do RNA test. Um, we're also looking at whether we can get a point of care test so that people could, um, who are coming to the outpatients especially could get a test back within a few hours. Um, it's been really important to have the staff education and awareness. The public health team has been really good at helping provide, so kind of motivating people to do it and then also working out ways to make it as simple and easy for people to kind of to, to do. And we're already organising a lot of blood tests when people are coming into our services anyway. There's also a new nurse referrer position um, who has sort of special training in Hep C um, and also has links uh, with fibre scan and liver clinics if, if those sort of things are needed and looking at APRA scores and that sort of thing. The prescribing is a lot easier now than it used to be. Uh, there, there's sort of two pangenitivic um, medications out. One of the issues that we still have is that if we could get people to go to our hospital pharmacy, but it's super expensive to get the medication through a hospital. So, uh, and it's, it's very well subsidized under the PBS system. So we still have to send people out of the hospital system to get the medication um, and then follow up and making sure people are adherent. So we're sort of looking at ways that the nurse referrer position can be um, used to help that. So it's still a bit of a work in progress, but it's, it's an, the other thing is we're not actually being inundated with positive tests. There's enough to make it worth doing, but not enough to necessarily have made it um, an overwhelming thing to have added into our routine sort of screening. Um, and just this last slide again, I mean, we use stage of change and motivational interviewing in our work, but I guess it's just a reminder that you need to think about where you're at and where your staff are at in terms of pre-contemplation or, or pretty keen to do something. Um, and, and, and kind of work out, I guess, the order of things that you go into and potentially motivate, find ways to motivate people to do stuff and make it as easy as possible. So there's just some thoughts. Thanks so much, Lawrence. Very good thoughts. And I love the, the categorization of the types of ways in which we might um, respond to, uh, I guess, the things that are, are outside our service philosophies or our specific service um, beliefs. And we do, I think with COVID, are going to have more things that fall into our lap that um, we need to respond to. So that is a concept um, really resonated with me. And thank you. I'm going to stop talking and hand straight over now to Professor Adrian Dunlop for a perspective from the Drug and Alcohol Clinical Services um, here more broadly in Hunter New England Local Health District to talk about uh, physical health comorbidities that he experiences in that context. Thanks again for being with us, Adrian. Thanks, Francis, and thanks, Lawrence, also um, for talking. Uh, I'm uh, also talking to you from Newcastle, land of the Awabakal traditional custodians, um, and nice to speak to you all today. Is the screen sharing working? It is, yes. Perfect, excellent. It's great when it works. Um, so when Francis asked me to talk about this topic, I Initially, it was a bit stumped, and I was trying to work out why I was stumped um, talking about health comorbidities. And then it sort of dawned on me once I started to do it. Um, health comorbidities are, are, 
are so sort of ingrained in well, so, so much a part of um, seeing patients or clients with drug and alcohol problem that I couldn't construct it as a separate construct. Um, and so once I worked that out, I found it pretty easy to talk about. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. But um, I should start by also acknowledging drug and alcohol treatment doesn't happen in one setting in Australia. So um, every state has its own nuances about how it provides treatment. Um, and that treatment is either integrally part of a state run health service, like here in Hunter, New England, where we're, you know, 150 staff over a very large geographical area as part of, you know, a health service that has 17,000 odd staff. Um, that's one, one setting, but there's lots of options too. So there's people working in small or large non-government organisations that may or may not be medicalised or demedicalised, may to, to different degrees have multidisciplinary teams and access to other clinicians, uh, may be integrated as part of some other sort of health service, may be part of another health service, um, Aboriginal community controlled health services, might be situated in another environment, in custody. Um, so there's, there's lots of variation in the theme and mine is biased from the setting that I've worked for the last decade or so as part of a state healthcare system. So the risk is that I, I make some, I overassume um, some of the issues about how integrated care is with other parts of healthcare. I don't think I'm gonna do that too much, but that's, that's sort of, that could be a potential bias I have. So in trying to think through um, healthcare problems for people who use drugs, there's a bunch of them. Here are some of them. So um, there's health problems that are directly related to the effects of the substance, either short or long-term consequences. You take um, opiates, you get sedated. There can be problems related to cessation. You withdraw from opiates, you can feel sick. There can be health problems related to that. Um, importantly, Problem, health problems related to risky, risky behaviours uh, related to acquiring or using substances. So um, in terms of acquiring substances, if it's a, an illegal, illicit drug, um, or even still many licit drugs, um, if, if people are involved in um, acquisitive crime or sex work or fraud or other things, there's risks associated with all of those. Um, and there can be health risks related to using substances. So, you know, injecting drug, drug use is, is, a, um, is a, a classic one of those. Um, and then there can be health problems related to getting over the effects of substances. So, you know, the alcohol hangover is one, but there can be stimulant sort of type hangovers and, and, and hangovers from the effects of, of other drugs too. So um, in this session, I'm not going to particularly talk about... Um, health problems related to the direct effects of substances, that is intoxication and withdrawal. You're probably familiar with all of them. You know, every substance has got its own intoxication and withdrawal syndrome. Well, except hallucinogens don't have a hallucinogens, don't have a withdrawal syndrome, clearly. Um, I'm not going to particularly talk about mental health comorbidities, you know, other than I have to make the statement, of course, they're very, very prevalent. Um, depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms, um, problems of, of trauma, including complex trauma. Um, I'm not going to delve deeply into the debate about whether there are personality disorders and how they might you know, be, be, be constructed within people who use drug and or use alcohol and other substances. Um, and I'm not going to particularly, so, you know, other than recognise they're highly prevalent and, and important, obviously, and important in trying to help people manage their own health. Um, and social comorbidities at a broader scale are, you know, probably the biggest single type of productivities related to substance use, especially, you know, intensive or regular substance use, uh, and, and some of them are listed there. And then thinking some more about um, harms from substance use, that model from Thorley, Thorley's domains is important. A lot of problems happen from in intoxication. Um, you know, say, for example, alcohol at a community level, that's, that's by far the biggest slice of the harms, of the acute harms from alcohol intoxication, car crashes, violence, etc. cetera. Um, but for the small popular, or the smaller population of people who develop regular use and dependence, a smaller group again, 
um, those harms are really amplified, all of those health harms, but all of the social harms uh, as well. And you can see a number of them are listed there. Then it's also worth just pointing out, this is from the um, Burden of Disease Study, um, that for different substances, these harms sort of play out differently. So for example, for tobacco, you know, a lot of the harms are respiratory harms or cancer related harms. Um, cardiovascular harms are also important. Um, for alcohol, it's a different pro, um, profile. So as I was saying before, injury is a far more common harm. Uh, mental health problems related to, to alcohol use are more common. Um, so the profile will be different. It'll be different if we put up cannabis or opioids or benzodiazepines, et cetera, as well. Then in trying to think about problems, and I'm thinking broadly just to start, it's also important to recognise um, when you're talking about harms, who you're talking about, the individual or others, um, and under-recognising the harms to others is a trap, and that can include physical harms, you know, something like, I think two in three Australians have, have been abused by somebody drunk um, in the last 12 months. Um, that's a common experience for this audience and the general community, I'm sure. So this um, study leading from a, a previous um, study published by David Nutt uh, a number of years ago now, you know, it's been redone for Australia and it just shows ranking, um, ranking drugs in terms of their harms. The red is harm to others and the blue is harm to the people who use drugs. But you can see the split is different when you, alcohol being the, the you know, arguably the most harmful drug um, and, and other drugs as you go along that scale. Um, and then it's important clearly if we're talking about harms to think a bit about how as a country we try to respond to those harms. Um, and I guess as, as Francis said sort of on the lead in, a key problem, um, a key problem with our system is that it's somewhat discoordinated and um, doesn't articulate, different bits don't articulate with each other really well. So uh, if, you know, if I was to, if, if I was a uh, person with a substance use problem, would I necessarily expect I'm going to routinely get high quality care in primary care? No, not necessarily. Depends a bit on the GP, depends on the setting, depends on the problem I present with. But um, you'd be well and truly familiar with the fact that a lot of people who use different substances underreport their substance use to healthcare professionals if they think they're going to get, um, uh, you know, adverse treatment as a result of that. And in fact, if you work in a treatment service, many people report exactly that in primary care and emergency departments, etc. So that's the problem. You know, the, the most accessible form of healthcare, primary care, something like 80% plus the population sees that in a 12 month. If that's not very accessible to people who use substances who are, you know, arguably a third or so of our population, at least having problematic use, um, then, then that's not a good structure response. But similarly, I could hardly jump around and say, ah, but the acute care systems solved it because it hasn't. Um, there are examples of where we try to better indicate, yeah, integrate care in the acute care system, but you know, I can't pretend that it's done um, well or routinely well. Anyway, in terms of how do we fund it, there's this, there's the problem with the, the federal state divide and the fact that the federal government sort of recognizes the NGO service that it runs or funds countrywide, but tends to not understand the state, state health care system. The state does about 40% of the funding, a lot of that's through federal grants. Um, public hospitals provide care, but, off, but usually don't recognise the patient has a substance use problem. Um, GPs are involved um, to a degree. Um, there's allied health involvement, but it's people with substance use problems is not attractive for many private um, psychology providers as well as GPs. So there's, there's, there's lots of structural problems with our system. I'm uh, going to skip over tobacco for smoking a bit because I think Lawrence um, covered it well. Highly, highly prevalent uh, in, in populations of people who use substances um, and also, unfortunately, often very treatment resistant. So people don't respond well um, to first line treatment like varenicline or NRT, et cetera. Um, we're doing some research here locally as part of different consortia 
um, on vaporized nicotine to see if that's any more effective in this population that that, that works underway. Um, cannabis smoking, again, highly prevalent in populations of people who use substances, um, common both as a, a primary and secondary substance, um, chronic obstructive lung disease uh, is a common problem for um, cannabis smokers alongside tobacco smoking because most people co-use in Australia uh, and, and probably under-recognised and under-treated. Now, some uh, maybe younger cannabis uh, users shift to uh, vaporised devices. They're probably much less harmful. Um, certainly in the long term, we don't have high quality data on that, but it, it makes some sense. So lots of gaps there. Um, in terms of injecting drug use, um, Lawrence talked to you a bit about hepatitis C treatment. Relatively straightforward, certainly much easier for people in tertiary settings and in primary care to do than hepatitis B or HIV treatment, uh, obviously far more, more prevalent. Um, some interesting clinical trials underway now to try to uh, reduce all of those, well, as many as possible of those barriers um, that Lawrence was talking about, um, including a, a novel one I know that's underway, the Quick Start program, which is, um, it's a randomised trial, but looking at having one group who just start treatment directly and then you tell them to stop it if they're hepatitis CRNA negative. So it'd be interesting to see how that, how that rolls out and if that's an effective mechanism. Um, infections, uh, common, highly common in, in so other, other um, injecting drug use related infections, for example, cellulitis, infective endocarditis, et cetera, septicemia, um, their particular problems in hospital settings for, for people who use um, substances. Uh, overdose, um, obviously possible for all substances. It has a, you know, an importantly different meaning sedative overdose compared to stimulant overdose. They're, they're two very different clinical presentations. Um, it's good that we have um, registered but not nationally accessible um, take-home naloxone programs. Um, three states are benefiting from the current federal trial and it would be amazing and wonderful if that becomes available to jurisdictions other than WA, South Australia and New South Wales. Um, it's certainly sorely needed across the country. Um, and as we see the ongoing implementation of real-time prescription monitoring systems, that's gonna be increasingly important to prevent harms related to opiate use. Um, and as I was saying before, yeah, the, the um, problems related to stimulant use are, are sort of are different, different in nature and uh, from sedation, they're from, from other stimulation. Uh, talked a bit about risky behavior before. One area that, that uh, I think there's now further uh, focus on is cognitive deterioration, you know, very possible for multifactorial alcohol, other substances from head injury, from the acute effects of alcohol, uh, et cetera. So, but, but, but poorly measured and poorly understood and um, can think of the classic anecdote of the patient uh, attending a clinic for methadone being told, ah, oh, you know, you've argued with Joe Bloggs yesterday, you know, you're not to come in here at 10 o'clock tomorrow, you've got to wait till 11 o'clock so you don't cross paths with Joe Bloggs. Person rolls up tomorrow, you know, the next day, totally forgetting the conversation. We don't think of it. The person gets punished for something. Um, you know, that's that's obviously really poor treatment, but we have to better recognize cognitive decline uh, in our patients. Alcohol, I won't go through the full list. Obviously, every organ system is affected by alcohol. Um, and uh, from, from chronic alcohol use, um, you can get problems in the brain, problems from injuries, uh, all sorts of gastrointestinal problems, um, peripheral R3, neuropathy, cardiomyopathy, uh, and risk increase for multiple cancers, including bowel, breast, oropharyngeal, and dual and larynx. So just to quickly flip now to, to how, um, how to better manage or prevent these, I guess in terms of treatment, as, as, as Francis said earlier, integrated care is the best, not always able to be provided. Lots of these things can be provided in drug and alcohol settings. Some of them require medical intervention. So that was that point before about if, if you don't have ready access um, to medical practices, that's make some of these things like treating hepatitis C, for example, harder. Um, prevention, um, you know, always interesting to argue about. How do we do this? It's not, we don't really understand. I mean, secondary and tertiary prevention, yes, but how do we how do we do good primary prevention? Um, 
and you can argue there's lots of things happening in Australia that are going in the other direction. Um, you know, increased disparity in, in wealth and um, housing affordability, et cetera. Anyway, coming to, to some of the interventions we know that work, um, things that we could do better, alcohol advertising, we could actually really ban alcohol advertising, not fake ban it and still promote it to minors as we do through sports. Um, we could implement minimum pricing uh, for alcohol. We could implement volumetric taxes, all sorts of things we could do and should do, but we don't do. Um, in terms of illicit substances, you know, there's a strong argument now going now about you know, other models, depenalization, decriminalization, uh, and there's certainly some evidence of the negative impacts of current, uh, this sort of current dysfunctional, dis joined system of saying yes substance use is a is a health problem but no it's actually policing it's a it's a law and order problem and so we'll respond by policing and sniffer dogs at festivals is one example there so what might we do fund more than one percent of treatment um stop it being 80 percent you know border interdiction policing customs control etc and fund health services more fund harm reduction services more yeah that, that would that would help improve the health of uh, people not not be sending people to, to jail with substance use problems. Yeah, that'd help uh, enormously. Uh, in terms of acute hospitals, um, hospital consultation layers and services, New South Wales Health did some work a decade ago showing that for every new, every additional clinician in a tertiary hospital you employed, you saved a net saving $100,000. Has that led to more positions in New South Wales Hospital? I think there's like two more positions maybe after a decade. It's, it's pretty paltry. So... Unfortunately, um, good evidence doesn't always follow policy change. I'm going to stop rabbiting on there so there's some time for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks so much, Adrian. I might actually just, well, thanks to all of you, actually, for those great presentations. They were wonderful. Um, I might just throw over to you firstly, Francis, though, to see if you had any comments or points you wanted to make to wrap it up. I absolutely do, and I, I don't think you're rabbiting on at all, Adrian. I think that the fundamental issue is the, the chronic underfunding of our mental health and drug and alcohol services um, in response to the demand for treatment. We can't just focus on supply um, issues. And I think um, for me, in listening to you both speak, uh, I was struck by uh, you know, Lawrence's comment about, you know, doing every, absolutely doing everything is far too much for any one clinician or any one service um, to, to do. Um, and also the, the imperative that if you do screen for something, which might be the most, the easiest of all the things to walk out and do today, um, then you do have to, to do something or know how to do something um, with those screening results. And so it, it presents a, a conundrum, particularly for, for clinicians and for, for people themselves who are looking to access treatment um, in a mental health or drug and alcohol service just to, to, um, to have the confidence to then act on some of those um, important screening results. And I really um, think that was really interesting to hear you say, Adrian, that uh, physical health being inextricably linked to drug use and drug use treatment made it a bit tricky for you to know where to start. But I think um, you, you demonstrated that really well um, in, in your talk. And whilst you were speaking, uh, both of you, I was thinking, of course, about um, e-health and the role of, of digital tools in responding to some of these challenges, even in just the short term, um, whilst we're waiting for system reform and adequate funding um, and for the fallout of COVID that will um, no doubt impact um, our service provision and, and philosophies going forward. Um, and certainly that's something that, uh, that the Lancet Commission, the Firth article, um, talked about as you know, a positive first step in trying to, to address and, and reduce some of these gaps that we might see all these challenges in, in responding to these physical, to the physical health needs of, of people who are accessing mental health and drug and alcohol store, um, services being um, screening and digital tools. And, and so I just wonder what you think about whether digital technologies, and by that I mean smartphones, even wearables, um, telehealth as a, as a one example of what we've seen during COVID, could they be a feasible or, or an accurate um, first step or a method of lifestyle assessment? Or, or do you see a role for these within your services um, or not? Lawrence, have you got any thoughts about that? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess one of the issues, and, and this is an area that you're obviously looking into, but it's the evidence base. So there's lots of stuff and lots of apps and things that have been brought onto the market, but not necessarily with a clear evidence base. So that's been one of the tricks. 
I do remember years ago before there were iPhones and things that Vaughan Carr had done a, a was involved in a study that showed that um, th there were lots of um, uh, self help things that were what had a big in, big uh, impact on mental health care because they were used by so many people. Um, and also some of Tony Jorm's uh, mental health literacy stuff, which has shown that a lot of people got their health literacy from their friends and families and things. So people are going to these sources anyway. And I think uh, whether we whether we want them to or not, that's where a lot of people are getting information. And so it, we, we should be trying to direct people to the best options and the most evidence-based that we can. Mm. Um, I just had a separate thought, but I'm not trying to derail it off, off this topic, but I was just thinking when everyone was talking that we have lots of people who are in our, you know, abstaining for periods of time that we continue to look after in a maintenance sort of phase. And they often in that phase start realising all these health problems that they've got mm -hmm. and, and then they want to do something about it. So when people are distracted by mental illness or distracted by lots of substance use uh, or, or prioritising substance use, a lot of that healthcare gets the physical comorbidity gets left behind. Um, so it's really important in that phase to start thinking about a, a lot of the physical healthcare at that point. And, and people are actually quite motivated to do it and they suddenly become aware of all these, all these issues. Um, and just to bring back to your point, yeah, a lot of our patients do find a lot of these online things and especially mindfulness apps and things like that quite useful. There's more and more um, CBT things. There's a, I forget the name, but there was a gambling, uh, I just forgot the name, but there's a gambling app that a few people have used that have found it really helpful. And it's a bit of a peer to peer um, kind of support group, but with some evidence base behind it too. Mm. Thank you. So yeah, there's really is a, we don't want there to be another silo between what's happening in the digital world um, and, and what clinicians and services are experiencing and, and people are experiencing um, on the ground as well. Um, mm -hmm. That's one more um, gap to, to bridge. And we're getting a few questions coming through that have a bit of a COVID specific lens. So Adrian, I might ask you the first one. Oh. Um, and that is firstly about um, people who are vaccinated and, and, and or not vaccinated and double vaxxed and whether um, you've been able to come up with any ideas or plans to provide care um, in mental health um, and, and therapeutic communities in that context, um, and also a little more broadly, whether these physical health needs as a function of COVID have had to take a back seat given all the pivoting that you've needed to do in your service context, um, and whether we're, we're almost back to the beginning of starting to consider how to reintegrate these physical health supports going forward. Yep, yep. Thanks, good question. Um, I mean, just flipping back to part of part of the, your first question, Francis. I, I think a, one good thing to come out of COVID is, you know, really a, a shake up of um, some of the more traditional systems, and like we've been forced to use a lot more telehealth. Um, not always, not always video. So a lot of it's phone um, too, because people might not have for smartphones or be able to access data and things like that. Um, and I think certainly the service I work in, it's, it's become much more flexible in the sorts of ways it'll respond. Um, have been thinking about, um, very specific about vaccination um, the last few weeks uh, as, as COVID sort of well and truly rolled through the Hunter New England area. Um, and so we're nearly finished going through all of our current patient list. Um, it's a large number, like it's, it's you know, nearly 2,000 patients um, and haven't got full data yet, but it looks like we're about 10 to 15% behind double vaccination rates compared to the general community in those areas. It does vary a bit. Some, sometimes it's not quite as bad. Um, there was a great presentation by Olivia Pierce at the APSAID conference um, last week, um, where she presented IDRS and EDRS data, um, specifically asking people about um, vaccination and what they thought. Um, and the biggest single reason in that um, in that survey was was concerned about side effects. You can understand why people might be um, concerned about about side effects. Um, there are a number of other things. So I think asking people about you know if they're not vaccinated, why aren't they vaccinated? What do they think? Um, in Western or Southwestern Sydney, um, the health district there has got 
the health department support here um, to incentivize vaccination. Um, so I'm going to be really interested and we'd like to repeat something like that here um, because there's evidence with other vaccination like hepatitis B vaccination is an example if you incentivize it that's the difference between some people getting vaccinated and some not it won't of course it won't get a hundred percent of people vaccinated but it might get um, 95 percent and there's no reason we should think that our patient group should have a target anything less than the general community's target so that will still leave you know, I don't know, maybe 5%, maybe it's going to be more of people who don't want to get vaccinated, can't get vaccinated. Yes, of course, we need to work out how we can continue to provide services um, to those people. It, it's sort of, it, it's a little bit hard to predict what's going to happen going into the future. The other problem with telehealth is for, for the, you know, very disadvantaged group of patients who don't have, don't have a phone, don't have access to phones, don't have money, are homeless, uh, are chronically in crisis, um, forcing them to use technology as a way to access systems is, is not good. So, um, you know, that's we, we still have to be further there for that population. And I guess, Lawrence, have you found it um, easy or the same to keep prioritising the physical health needs of, of people coming through your service through COVID? Or has that been a bit more of a challenge? And do we need to reintroduce that sort of a, a push or a philosophy as we as we come out of COVID? I mean, we've started reintroducing kind of online groups, um, which is kind of going okay. It's not quite as good and it's not quite as big a commitment. And I mean, there's been some interesting times when, you know, if someone gets on a bus to come to a group and they, they tend to just kind of follow through with it, but if they are at home joining in online and then something goes wrong or they can't be bothered, then it's very easy just to drop out. So that sort of thing has been a bit more difficult. Um, but yeah, I guess in terms of the groups and stuff we run, like I was saying, we, we do make like looking after some of these comorbidities a big part of it. I know in our ant abuse group, uh, so people who are voluntarily taking ant abuse so that they can't easily go back to drinking. I mean, they can always choose that they should wait a few days or a week at least um, um, before they start drinking again. But, uh, but a lot of those people, their hypertension will be fixed. And actually, if they're on a lot of antihypertensives, you've got to watch out for that as a potential issue. So, I mean, I guess that's the interesting thing that I hadn't sort of put into my talk, but treating mental health and drug and alcohol is a big step forward to managing a lot of physical comorbidity as well. And I know we focus a lot on what we cause, but um, we do do some good as well. Um, the, the big issue, I think, um, is it's harder and harder to find bulk billing GPs um, to link with. And um, as Adrian said, uh, we, we are more represented with patients that might struggle to do the online uh, meetings and, and see GPs online and things like that. Um, and there's such a big waiting list that, they, that they're at risk of being dropped off the few around that do bulk bill. So it's a it's a, a problem. I know in the Northern Territory, they employed a GP in the mental health service uh, community um, and that worked quite well, but that had hiccups and ups and downs and you've required the right sort of person to do the job and, and you needed people to be referred there, otherwise it wasn't worth them coming in. So, you know, there's a whole lot of ideas around, but it's not always easy. And then in the remote Aboriginal medical service stuff or even the local ones, um, that's kind of very integrated into a kind of GP holistic care. And then I come in as part of that broader holistic care. So that, that's quite a good setting to work in because everything's kind of, like, instead of me being a separate silo, I go into that silo if you like. And so it becomes a bit more holistic. So, I mean, that works pretty well. Um, indeed, and I'm just I'm seeing the, the questions pop up on the Q&A panel and, and thanks Adrian for, for getting on and responding to them live. There's one from Jessica who I'd uh, like to um, just, I'd like to pose it to the, the panel to you both here. So Jessica works in advocacy service with people who are involuntary in mental health settings and some of those people flag that they might need withdrawal assistance but find it's often not part of, of their medication regime upon admission and do you 
Lawrence or Adrian have any thoughts on how people um, wanting to access this type of, of support can influence the service um, that they receive, especially when they're in that involuntary position um, with their admissions? Um, Adrian, first thoughts? Really quickly, it, it ought to be part of the skill set of clinicians. And, and if they, they don't have it, then they should be able, able to access support to provide it. Mm. Lawrence? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's it's people saying that is something that they need to be aware of. And this is one of those things that actually can be urgent, especially with benzos and alcohol. Um, uh, in Hunter, New England, there's some really good guidelines that are designed for everybody to be able to use very safely. So, that, you know, you've got the backup of guidelines. If you're not sure what to do, they're very easy to look up on the internet. Um, so for me, I guess it's making people aware that they should be aware of this and, and that there is there's some easy pointers if they forget what to do. Um, so it, it shouldn't be such a big drama. Um, but it's, it's, that, it's that awareness, the screening, I guess, and also the people feeling like they've got somewhere to go once they've identified a positive case. But I think those guidelines make it super easy for anybody, any time to manage it. Um, indeed, and I think um, guidelines like the comorbidity guidelines, which is why we're all here together, um, are, are really important advocacy tools um, for this very situation, um, as much as the individual service um, guidelines and, and philosophies as well. We've still got a couple of questions on the panel, but we are out of time. So I might um, hand back to Kath to wrap us up um, with the promise that we will get to those questions uh, via email following the session. So thank you both, Lawrence and Adrian. Over to you, Kath. Thanks, Francis, and thanks, uh, Adrian and Lawrence as well. I could easily stay here for a lot longer continuing on these discussions as well. Um, and I'm sorry that we do need to wrap it up, but thank you again, everyone, for having joined us for the webinar. Uh, again, if you're interested in viewing the recording um, or registering our, for our upcoming webinars or looking at our library of previous webinars and resources, you can do so at the comorbidity website on your screen there. Um, and our next webinar will be, uh, is actually myself and uh, one of our PhD students, Logan Harvey, talking about trauma-informed care in alcohol and other drug treatment settings on the 9th of December. And we also have a neurocognition one coming up in 2022. That's uh, the date just to be confirmed as yet. But until then, thank you again for joining us. Thank you to our presenters and uh, please enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>